Sunday papers, Sunday papers, Sunday papers with Greg and Mike. There it is, and you can take it away, sir. Read all about it. Read all about it. We're both in L.A. Why are we in the same studio? Read all about it. We going to do that at some point? Sorry, I'm joining late. What was that? I said, uh, we're both in L.A. How come we're not in the same studio? Do we want to try that soon? Oh, because COVID's not at its outrageous high point right now. It's not. but, Can uh, I show you my coffee mug that I'm drinking from right now? I'd love to see it. And you got a... That's your dad! Greg has held up a coffee mug that is Fitz and Rosenberg, which is the name of the morning show, 5.30 a.m. to 10 a.m. And on top of his dad's face, it says Fitz mug, and it's a drawing from WNEW, 11.30 a.m. This was his. This was his coffee mug. And uh, years after he died, there's a woman who uh, worked for him, who was his producer. And I went to Columbus, Ohio to do a show and she came out to see me and, and she and brought, brought me the brother. mug. <laughs> <laughs> brought my brother. <laughs> and, uh, and I've got the mug, so I'm thinking maybe I'll give it to Owen and he can drink from it when he does his radio show at DePaul. Oh, man. It would be great if you had two of them. That's a very cool mug. It's not awesome. Yeah, and your dad didn't go with Maroon. It's interesting. Didn't go with Maroon. No, he tried to break from the Fitz because his grandfather's radio show was all Maroon. <laughs> Wait, uh, that was uh, what? Uh, what's his name? Gentleman name back to. What's your grand? Or is that your mom's name? Oh, uh, Florence McCarthy. Florence. Yeah. Yeah, that was my mom's side. Oh, okay. Hey, Florence. Yes. <laughs> I think it's eleven thirty a.m. Right? That's what they called it. Eleven thirty. Um. Yeah, WNEW. I mean, when he was on WNEW, it was the number one station on AM, and was AM gigantic. was way bigger than FM back then. And then I, we watched we watched AM uh, kind of fade into the background over like our you know teenage years. So we're believe it or not, we're not eighty, and uh, we're in our mid fifties. And music was we listened to music music on AM radio. Yeah. Zeppelin, everybody. Back, you know, when actually Zeppelin was current. And uh and it was what I'm saying is FM was nothing. It was it's weird. It's weird to think about. Yeah, FM was was like podcasts. It was like a weird long form rock and roll came out on it. And but but it had a way better sound because AM FM stands for frequency modulation and it's a oh. much it's a much denser wave, and it carries more audio frequency on it than AM. And uh, so so immediately they started moving the music shows to FM, and then AM became all talk radio and sports. I do not think I'm making this up. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not making it up, but I might have something wrong. <clears throat> AM radio, because of that thinner, whatever the, the terminology is, that frequency... That frequency can travel so much further. And people in the Berkshires get AM radio from New York City. And like you, you, you always hear these legendary stories of Bob Dylan like huddled around a radio in Hibbing, Minnesota, trying to get broadcasts out of Midwest and and you know, like Tennessee and trying to get these broadcasts. You there are legendary stories of uh, musicians in Key West, listening to Cuban music. Oh, wow. And, yeah, listening to Cuban music, which was coming across on that frequency because there was zero access to Cuban music and stuff like that. So anyway, I was in Nova Scotia when I was in grammar school visiting. I was probably in sixth or seventh grade. visiting my. I was on my grandmother's farm in Cape Breton, an island off Nova Scotia. And I am telling you, I listened to Howard Stern on AM. Uh, I got reception there. Now, was it relayed in Boston? I don't know. That's the part that I might have wrong. But I, I honestly think, I mean, I, I searched like crazy for, uh, what was it, WNB? No, no, no. Was it WNBC? Uh, uh, WNBC, yeah. Yeah, AM radio. And um, 
Anyway. And that's what Howard Stern was on. My father was on NEW with on NBC with uh, Howard Stern and uh, what was the guy? Don Imus was really big. Wow, You're right, and right, of course. Bob Grant and uh, Wolfman Jack had a show on there. He did the Midnight <laughs> Shift. But uh, I think but, the, I think AM, even though it's not as good quality, it travels further. That's my understanding. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um. So big week for me. Oh, I um I started my microdosing of mushrooms. I so I'm taking them every three days. I took one on Monday. I took one on Thursday, and uh, I feel good. Really? Yeah, I really feel like my creativity is flowing. My highs are better. Uh, I feel more steady. Uh, I think I and and I've read a lot. I did a lot of research this week about it, and and. Uh, it just deals with a lot of the issues I'm dealing with, depression, and um, so we'll see. That's fantastic. And yeah, and maybe Aaron will let you move back in the house. That might be one of the factors going on. <laughs> You're in the guest house now, which is giving you a little <laughs> emotional space. I get it. I'm just afraid uh, of COVID. Well, actually, I have to be careful now because uh, she, you know, she's a postnatal doula now, and she just got a new client who had a baby. Yesterday, so she's going to start working with the with the new mom starting today or tomorrow at one a.m. or when? No, I think normal hours. Wow, good for her. Right in um, Venice, yeah, it's a French fam, French couple, and uh, so she'll help the woman with her breastfeeding, and because uh, she's not just a doula, but she's also a lactation consultant, so she's uh, she's all over this shit. It's pretty exciting. It's her new gig. Well, you know, I'm an incredibly supportive guy, and if Aaron needs help with those French breasts, um, <laughs> count. I already asked her what seat, what yet. cup size the woman had, and she did not answer and was not <laughs> entertained. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, good luck with that filthy, unvaccinated French family. Right. That's what that's what I do when I'm rejected. I immediately turn on them. Um. All right. Well, good for you. Now, why is it every three days? Because you don't want to build up too much tolerance to the psilocybin. Oh, wow. Because if you take them every day, you build up tolerance very quickly. And so if you take it, like, let's say it's Monday, I think you said that. Tuesday how are you, and Wednesday, how are you feeling? Still feel it. Still feel no. it. Well, well, you don't feel like, I don't feel buzzed from it. I, I right. wouldn't say that. There's a the lightest of buzzes. But it's more of just like an awareness uh, and a presence that you have. I found myself doing shows this week and I was like kind of riffing better and I was a little calmer on stage. Um, yeah. This could, be, this could be your answer. Oh my God, I hope so. I'm so tired of being depressed. I'm sick of it. Jeez, I, I honestly don't know how you do it. Truly. <clears throat> um, and uh, Well, I you don't. Know I mean, you remember we went, we went up to Malibu to interview... Um, who was the writer from the New York Times that that we interviewed? Yeah, yeah. he wrote uh, the game and uh, the truth. And I'll get his Neil Neil, uh, yeah. Neil Strauss. Neil Strauss, who's this really famous writer, and uh, we went up to interview him. And he had done a piece on me in the New York Times in 1996, I think, when I uh, was hosting a game show on MTV and I had a development deal for a sitcom and I had just done Letterman for the first time and it was this amazing two page spread. And then he said to me, when we interviewed him, he goes, how come you didn't make it big? <laughs> He's like, what happened? Do you remember that? Yes. And and I thought about it a lot since then, obviously, because it was kind of a gut punch. It was really like, yeah. you know, first of all, I said, I own a fucking house in Venice. I have had a very good career. He's like, yeah, but I really thought you were going to make it big. And the truth is, I've struggled with depression my whole life, and every time I get some momentum going, I crash out and I disappear, and I don't follow through. And it's been my life, my career has been a series of great starts and no follow through, and it's because of the depression. Well, I feel honored meeting you here at the bottom. Uh, this is it <laughs> on this podcast. No, well, here's the thing, if I may. I wish you had told me this. He is. He, I like Neil Strauss a lot, and he and I spoke 
after that, like he wanted not 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 for long, but if two phone calls probably about a project that he he was thinking about. So, and I and I loved his book, The Game, which was the book that followed. Uh, sorry, The Truth. It followed the game. The game was about pickup artists, all about how to get laid, and the truth opening page is him going to sex rehab and then he questions monogamy i recommend it to anyone it's fantastic but he has an ego um you can see it on his instagram and i think it's an, a little bit of an inflated sense of he you know he's an experiential writer and for the new york times so when he talks about like doomsdayers he immerses himself when he talks about pickup artists he immerses himself so he's earned some stripes this is all to say he was really asking at that moment how did i get that wrong in other words i know ev i know ev like in other words i took a deep dive on you greg fitzsimmons in 1996 and i'm kind of almost always right yeah and so what happened here and when the obvious answer is how many fucking ultra successful comedians are there uh, one hand we can count them right and uh but i think so you know it, it is a weird thing and i think it was good that i thought about it because i think everybody feels frustrated at where they're at and i'm not that much you know the truth is you aren't i i'm happy to be in the middle i really am i really appreciate that uh i'm sorry this podcast is all about me but this mushrooms is making me think about this stuff no, I think um, this is interesting. I mean, I think being in the middle is something that- Oh, did that... we start the podcast? <laughs> Holy shit. All right, I'm going to clap in three. I, I think that, you know, being able to, you know, live a very comfortable life and take care of my kids and and all that stuff, uh, while also not getting accosted on the street and not being constantly hit up. You know, like I just think about how many emails and tax bill Burr gets every day from people that want something from him. And then you question your friendships because you don't know if people really like you because of you or because of what you represent. Fame is such a fucking commodity in this town. And having, you know, and I've had moments of it. I've had, you know, when I have a project going on, I feel the difference. I see when people start coming out of the woodwork and asking, even if it's just to hang out, you question it. It's weird. And I live in a but, neighborhood where I'm not surrounded by people like that. I'm surrounded by very normal, grounded people, mostly writers. And uh, and I've managed to have a, a healthy, successful life. But then when Neil asked me that, it did make me stop and say, I have had a lot of plate, sh you know, steps up to the plate. And they have none of the big ones have gone. And uh, why is that? And I really have to say, just give yourself a break. You just were born with a fucking an, a kill switch that just goes off sometimes and you just shut down and there's nothing you can do about it except mushrooms. I'm not buying all of that. I don't want to invalidate you, but the, I really did bury the lead. Interesting context here. We went up to his house. He had his little baby and he had his uh, wife, right? And he wrote about them in that book, The Truth. And uh, it's the love of his life. He was doing everything to change his behavior, his mindset, so he could settle down with this woman who was the the love of his life. Uh, he asked you that question when we we're up in Malibu, and one of the you don't measure success by your career. In fact, it's not even your first thought. You you have this amazing family, and you are incredibly present. Your fucking kids are your best friends, yet also a dad to them in the right way where you can't be their friend. And Neil Strauss got divorced a few months later. He did? Yes. Wow. And so here's a guy asking because— I hate that that cheers me up. Well, no, but what I'm saying is this, and it's and I'm not even really trying to burn Strauss on this. What I'm saying is his brain is very much calibrated on success is measured by your career. Um, and so that predisposes him to have that view and to ask that question. When I also want to get back to the handful of comedians that we do know, whatever, I've always said this too. Like, at whatever age you learn that your heroes have fucking problems, it's like 
Bob Dylan was more of a, uh, probably in some ways spent more time with me than he did his own kids. You know what I mean? Like Bruce Spring, whoever's on your list, they are spending so much time on you, the fan. Yeah. Touring, writing, their craft, everything that gets to you from their creative process. They're very seldom in their home and for sure not a hero in their home. Right, right. No, it's true. I, and I do think about that stuff. And it is one of the first things I look at when I meet, you know, you meet like a Ben Stiller or somebody who does three movies a year. And then you see them in an interview and they say that their family, their family is the most important thing to them. And you always go like, is it though? Is it? Or is that just something people say? Do you live that or do you say that in interviews? I and, also... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. And, and it is true. Like, I cherish my friendships, including yours and my, my you know, my, my relationship to my wife. As you know, it's like we don't have big fucking fights. I was just thinking about that yesterday. Like, our we, we had a little conflict, and it resolves within a few minutes usually. And I just I think she's the greatest woman I've ever met. And I feel well, that's what drives me. And um, my well, day-to-day you life it. is You're good. You're like, I got it. French woman's tits. I got it. All right. I know. I'm going to back off. You're right. You're right, honey. But honey, you should take photos at work for your website. I think it would help show off what you do. How's the latching? Do you do you videotape it? Now, when you videotape it, do her feet get in the shot? <laughs> oh, no. You're not into French woman feet. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, And also, a uh, feather in your cap, if I may, is... You have, and this is self-serving to say this because we share so many, you have the greatest and largest group of friends and not really one, not one stand-up or real, you know, like entertainment, someone who loves entertainment in the mix. Like even Matt Malloy, he just, he's like, oh shit, I got this, I got this show. Like he just wants to enjoy life like like we are all like minded like that like yeah. there are real boundaries between our careers and what's most important right and Dennis Gubbins keeps us really grounded in not taking work <laughs> seriously at all if it, there if, it is. if <laughs> yes <laughs> now so um yeah so anyway we'll see how I'm the mushrooms I'm glad about go. these mushrooms dude yeah and uh Shit, man, I wish you had told me about that question and how much uh, it made you think about things. Because, yeah, there was a lot to, I I think, contextualizing it, understanding who's asking that question, you know, and uh, helps, I think, a lot. Yeah, yeah. And then also, yeah, to look at, you you never, you're saying you stepped up to the play a lot, and this is the last thing we'll say about it, or the last thing I'll say. You said you stepped up to the play a lot, and you've had these really big projects, but I've never known you to be like, I'm fucking all in. Like, I, like I, I've even had writers who were so rattled. This is just a writer on a sitcom, keep in mind. They left, they got a hotel, like, the week they were out on script. Yeah. When they had two young kids and a wife because their sleep wasn't good in the house. Right. And it's like, we would never, no matter how big the step up to the plate is, we would never even think of doing that. Right, right, right. Um, so anyway, yeah. All right. All right. So let's get it. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks for sitting in on my therapy session. I feel a lot better. Um, where, where are you off to? You're flying off to Oregon today? Bend, Oregon, which I hear nothing but unbelievable things about. My niece, the great Caroline is at, uh, Eugene as Gubbins screams at her every time he sees her. Sco ducks. And, uh, so, my sister, my dad, and Sophie, whose birthday it was this week, which don't tell her. I remember. I never forget it because Bob Dylan's is two days before it. And so uh, they're up in Eugene. They're driving to Bend. Olivia and I are flying to Bend today at like uh, three, three something. That's got to be really a connecting psyched. flight. No. Really? Direct nice. To an airport called Redmond in uh, Oregon. Very nice. I know. Oh, I'm that's surprised gonna, too, actually. This is the perfect time of the year for that. Um, it is. Although, oh my God, <clears throat> I looked at the weather this week, you know, because the girls were like, 
bring a raincoat. There's rain in the forecast. I bend, I guess, where we're going, which is something river, is is at around 5,000 feet or whatever. And there are ski mountains and all that right around it. And uh, it's going in the 30s on two of the nights I'm there. No shit. Yeah, which I love, but thank God I found that out. Damn. Yeah. Um. Well, that sounds awesome. And you're all staying in a house? All staying, yeah. We rented this house, which is in the, like, kind of resort. It's not really a resort. It's These are home, you know, homes where people live. But it's like a Palm Springs, those homes, you know, on a golf course type thing. And how, how many days are you staying? Memorial, happy Memorial Day weekend, everybody. Oh, yeah, it's Sunday, Memorial Day. Wow, summer. Happy summer, everyone. It's happy summer. It's my official yep. start of summer. So we're there till you know, we come back Monday. Nice. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm trying to see what other notes I had here. Oh, this is kind of a little, not really that funny, but so I was thinking of, like, getting, I was thinking, like, oh, you know, maybe a big mirror here, like Sophie's moved back in her room or whatever. So I'm like, all right, what's easiest? I go on Craigslist and I go on, like, Facebook Marketplace, it's called. Anyway, one of the mirrors, the description was gently used mirror. <laughs> I never stared. I never stared at myself. I glanced. I'm like, you would just you would just walk by it and like you would never stand still in front of it. Or are you really good looking? Is that what you mean? Yeah, this thing never had to contort an ugly person in it. Yeah. I'm like, cause I'm gonna put some city miles on it. I'm gonna tell you right now. <laughs> There's gonna be raz there's gonna be razor blade marks on it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Wow. Wait till you see how hard hard used this mirror is gonna be. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm uh I just got an email literally two minutes ago saying uh Segura the wants are poisonous. Segura wants me to moderate a he's got a book coming out and we're, he's doing a big theater in Santa Monica and he wants me to be the moderator just me and him dude that's pretty cool that's very cool yeah and you can ask uh, him all about his private jets and his six hundred thousand dollar cars I want to know the answers oh I'm gonna shit all over him <laughs> I I this is gonna <laughs> that's all I'm gonna do <laughs> oh that's fantastic man yeah, that'll be fun. So I got to read the book. Or as Zach said, when I asked him to write the foreword on my book, he goes, uh, I can't wait to have somebody read this to me. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, I know it's not a sponsor today, but Audible, I downloaded Mary Lynn Rice Cub has a book. Oh, that's right. Fame-ish. Yeah. So I'm going to listen to that. You know, she's one of my favorites. Why don't I listen to it also? And then we'll have her call in on uh, Sunday Papers. Should we do that? Of course. Okay. Yeah. That'll be good. She's incredibly edgy, very, very different and alternative, although she's gotten more, less alternative, or people have caught up to her. I don't know what it is, but, you know, she's doing her stand-up. There's no way she could have done, like, an improv in a city in the Midwest. Like, it was so, so... Like the, it was the comedians were dying laughing in the back of the room. This is back in the aughts, yeah, in the nineties. This is and back, the aughts. yeah, even in the late nineties. Yeah, and um, I just was amazed by her. No, so, her stand up now. She's in the comedy store in the trenches, yep. following fucking Joey Diaz and whoever else, and she holds her own. She, oh, she's yeah. a good stand up. Yeah, no, she's great, and she's on the road, like really doing, uh, doing the doing all the same clubs I'm doing. It's crazy. Yep. No, it's awesome. Um, this, this week's logo, very nice, very cool one. That's uh, a very cool one. Uh, if you want to check out this guy's artwork, it's at Ryan star design, two R's. And today's song is from Les Conley, which I found out is a man. I think we had uh, misidentified Les Conley as a woman or wondered whether or not it was a woman. I would have assumed that was, you know, like. Les Moonves. I don't know. I would have assumed. Uh, well, it is a man, and um, he is a homosexual. I also assume that. No, I have no idea. He could be. Les is lesbian. Um, Maybe he identifies as straight, but we all know what's going on. All right. All right. Uh, corrections from last week. All right. Ryan McDaniel said, Nurse here. 
Give fentanyl, give fentanyl all the time. A standard dose is 25 to 100 micrograms. So you were right in the first place that two milligrams is lethal. Oof. Uh, two, point, point 0.2 grams is 2,000 micrograms. Uh, so oh. love you guys. And then, and then he writes, Everett House. That's the uh, nude spa in in Portland, Oregon. That that a friend of mine went to, and then and then sent me, and I went to. I told that's, you about that, right? That's hysterical. Yes. Yeah. That's great. I can't, It's one of those things where I go like, you ever have something in your life, and you remember that you did it, and then you go, I fucking did that. Yeah. I went into a nude spa and got naked and walked around. What? Every week I have that, I did that thought about the previous week's podcast. <laughs> uh, Tubal Kane said, Gibbons opening the show, the pandemic is not over. More people are getting infected and they're all vaccinated. A little later, more than 15 minutes about bad man Eric Clapton, who is against venues that have <laughs> vaccine mandates. Got it that you got to try and fill a few hours, but Clapton doesn't seem such a bad man in context. Oh, my God, Tubal, if that's your real name. You're conflating so many things here. Vaccines work. I mean, is that the debate? Vaccines have lessened the uh, the hospitalizations and deaths. Is that is that's not entering your thing? These two can't coexist. I mean, it's an interesting. I'm impressed with the thinking. And he's a good listener. I'll give you that. <laughs> but you got a few things. We're not going to debate if vaccines are effective, okay? We're just not. And have they slowed the spread? Would it be worse? I happen to think uh, yes You don't think yes. that. We know that. That's not we a thought. That. That's not an opinion. That's fact. Right. Getting COVID now is a drag. I would have been the biggest fucking dick in the world if I said that two years ago and yeah. and it, and I would have been a liar and I would have been invalidating everybody who had relatives dying and now it's a drag and not everyone dies I get it but my mom was out of chemo and I and I was terrified about it. And the vaccines now have made it so I can see her more and whatever okay we're good Clapton's a dick all right his his other and thing also is awesome that can coexist yeah he does seem like a dick uh, and for all the appreciation of Updike literary prose, in The Natural, the book as opposed to the movie, Roy Hobbs struck out, took the payoff through the game. I don't think that is based on Ted Williams. No, wow. That's all right. So listen, Trubal is a great listener, and I want to give him credit for that. Thank you for writing in, and thank you for listening. That's actually extraordinary about The Natural book. I had no idea. It was uh, Bernard Malamud wrote that. So, you know, Bad News Bears, I got it, you know, it was one of my favorite movies of all time and and holds up despite the generous use of the N word. So um, the they got Bob, Billy Bob Thornton, I think. I never saw the new one, but I heard and I'm like, well, that's a great sign out of the gate because I love him. And also his brand is like this isn't going to be fluffy and bullshit hopefully. And uh, I heard that it was a like throwdown over Hollywood saying they have to win at the end. Oh, Which, really? Yes. So listeners can write in anyone who's seen the uh, new one. I that's what I heard. Do Did they, they win, win at the end? At the end? Huh? Did they win at the end? Uh, that's my understanding. But I don't really know. And that this is such a beautiful part of the first movie. One of the most beautiful parts of the first movie. Yeah. The original. Right. Um, um, I got a show tonight. If you guys hear this on Sunday, the 27th of May, I'll be at the Irvine Improv. Oh. Coming up in a couple weeks, I will be in Bakersfield, California, at a place called The Well on June 11th. Um, let's get to it. Let's get to the front page. You got I don't paper? Got paper. You got paper. You're in an office. There we go. Oh, I love it. There's a little memo that says your Wi-Fi stinks and it's going to be down today. It's my, um, it's the comic pay breakdown. At the end of when I do a club for the weekend, it tells me how many tickets I sold and at how much. 
and You've how much actually rattled that exact piece of paper before and how much how much money they they made or lost on me <laughs> a week ago that piece of paper would get you down but not with the shrooms uh, no i feel good about them losing a little money okay uh, the lead story of this podcast here is we go ellen, big story ellen degeneres ends her pioneering talk show under cloud. Oh. So there was lots of articles about this and about how her legacy has really been tainted. And Oh, my God. The L Did you read the L.A. Times piece? No. Was it Oh, was it my tough? God. It was written uh, from the perspective of a gay person and how she was such a hero and how she completely squandered it and disappointed all gay people by the way she really didn't deal with it. And, you know, hanging out with George Bush and forgiving Kevin Hart on her show about his uh, saying he was going to beat his son if he was gay. And there was just a bunch of moments where she, I think she got that one right, but okay. I, I, I do also, I think the guy apologized in the past. They wanted him to fucking trot out and dance and apologize again. And he went, fuck you. I already did it. He actually did say sorry to say, he's like, listen, I said, sorry, I am sorry, but I'm not going to fucking, you know, right. yeah, go through everything. But he actually, it wasn't like he dug in and says, you're not owed another apology. He's just yeah. like, it's just not going to be a sh this. I'm not going to be vilified on a, on a mass scale. Yeah. Um, so there's tons of articles about it. And, uh, but what was interesting to me and we should do this more often. So one of the things I clicked by accident, cause I'll avoid Yahoo, like no one's business. It's, I, I don't even understand what type of person goes to Yahoo? So the article was in Yahoo, and the comment section at the time I read it had 290 comments, and here were some of them. Randy990020 said, I was never a daytime talk show fan, and not because I worked during the day. I never watched a single episode. The same could be said for Oprah and her show. So I'm like, all right, well, <laughs> thanks for the comment. Yeah. Then Stormy 8's like, if you watch this daytime BS you need a hobby. Really, Stormy 8, who clicks on an article about daytime <laughs> and spends <laughs> the time going yeah. to the comment section? And had and to create an identity. She had to log in. Shane K.O. says, I worked. Who has time to watch TV? Three question marks. Shane, you do. You do. You are in the <laughs> Yahoo comment section about on a story on a story that you have no interest in. Yeah. Goble says, Yahoo, you're becoming really annoying with your quote, waiting to post your comment nonsense. I left Facebook and didn't look back for similar reasons. Don't think and many others won't stop patronizing your antique site. Delay posting that. <laughs> wow. Dragon Great. Lady. That was from Dragon Lady. No, that was Gobo. Uh, oh. Drag Dragon Lady is the next one. Uh, but Gobo, yeah, like getting into it. <laughs> Poor Yahoo, the comment section. They're going to have to look into this. They're delaying her things. Dragon Lady, bunch of numbers, says, even retired, all caps, I do not watch daytime TV. I barely watch TV at all. There is so much more to do rather than waste time watching TV, <laughs> says Dragon Lady, <laughs> who is writing a comment in the TV section of Yahoo. Uh, and then the last one I, I grabbed was from E, and it said, I read about a guy who knew Ellen when he was a little fat, when he was a fat little kid. <laughs> Ellen worked at his mom's business. He said she was just mean, just a mean person. I believe him. Finally, a good comment to end it all about the fat little kid. <laughs> oh, good. So we know that it wasn't like fame that made her mean. It was just... She's just a mean person. Yeah, she sees a fat little kid, and she's gonna. She's not gonna be nice. Um, no matter by the what. way, the show ended. We're taping this on Friday. The last episode was yesterday, which means ding, 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 fireworks. We are out of our non-disclosure agreement. Right, we can maybe. now talk about having worked on the show. Yeah, maybe. By the way, I think they're perpetuity. Who the hell knows? No. 
No, this is like because we slave. could ruin. Like if she didn't already ruin her legacy, we could ruin it, and that that hurts the market, the market potential for reruns and syndication and all that stuff. I just got a fat check from Ellen the other day. Residuals. No, you did not. I did get a big fat check. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. I feel like a, a, a freed slave. This is like the day the sl- f- slaves were freed. You ever hear? Uh, of- I, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's exactly that, Greg. Have you ever heard Neil Brennan's <laughs> bit about the day the slaves are freed? No. And the plantation owner comes out on the front porch and he's like, okay, uh, listen up, guys. Uh, hope there's no hard feelings. Uh, big announcement. <laughs> That's good. Uh, it's good. All right, Look, so our next story, which we don't want to do, but outrage is NRA to gather in Houston just days after Texas school massacre. So just days after the largest, uh, the deadliest mass shooting in Texas history, and there have been a lot in Texas, uh, the National Rifle Association, uh, America's leading gun lobbyist group, will meet a few hours away from Houston on Friday, which is the Right now, when we're recording this, speakers include, or they did include, I don't know if they've bailed, Greg Abbott, the Texas uh, governor, Senator Ted Cruz, and former U.S. President Donald Trump. And so, I don't have any jokes. But one real question, how insane do you think the security is going to be at this event? Yeah, yeah. Ironically. Yeah, it should be. It should be because I'm sure there's a lot of people that would uh, like to see those guys on the wrong end of this issue in a real way. And why would security be really huge and really tight? And I do not think they're allowing guns, even though in Texas you can do that, Uh, because I think they realize that a lot of people who shouldn't have guns have guns. Right. And they might come to this thing. Right. Because it's America. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I posted on my Instagram, which is Gibbons time. I only say that not to go there for me, but to go there and watch. I remember vividly. It's crazy when I really think about how much all in the family shaped my sense of humor and comedy and that how lucky I was. I'd watch it at my grandmother's house in the Bronx. We'd got get together and the Jeffersons was on right after it that I grew up with a that pedigree of comedy, like infusing, you know, just coming into my brain and my awareness and my consciousness. Uh, I'm the luckiest person. But it was a episode on gun control. And uh, the local news gave Archie a couple of minutes, as local news used to do. They sometimes would give a viewer like a minute in front of the camera to read an editorial. His was on uh, gun control and especially hijacking and uh, stuff. And he's like, I have the solution that will answer all the problems, arm all the passengers. <laughs> when you're in the airport <laughs> ready for takeoff, everyone gets a gun. When you land, they all hand, they hand the guns back in. And it's, and it was the funniest thing in the world. And guess what? It still is. Yeah. That the conversation from the Republican side is more arming, more guns to solve this problem is where do you even begin it's insanity well first of all let's just do a very simple math equation how many people have committed atrocities with guns and how many atrocities have been stopped by a citizen carrying a gun i think right. let that math problem be the solution yeah, the whole thing. And, you know, everyone, everyone, listen, everyone seems to be posting the right stuff. And, but, you know, Beto O'Rourke, man, he's, he's admirably angry. And how about uh, Steve Kerr? That Steve Kerr thing was fantastic. Man, he fucking nailed it. He's like, how do we have 90% of the population wants background checks and your elected leaders don't have the backbone to not take money from the NRA? So they can get reelected to represent you. It doesn't make any fucking sense. And most of Texas, same thing. Like even there, most of them want the uh, rules in place that Abbott is rejecting. Right. Anyway, let's not uh, get hung up on this. No, we don't have to get hung up on it. But I think one effective way to be like tech, you know, like Beto could be like, listen, Texans aren't this stupid, which I don't believe. 
but they're not this stupid. Here's the good news. Most of us want these rules. Like, that's a giant thing for Texas to scream, I think. And now we can leave the subject. All right. Uh, let's go to New York. Tough gun laws. Love it. Let's talk about the gun situation in New it's York. It's the end of an era. The New York City removed its last public payphone on Monday. The boxy enclosures were once an iconic symbol across the city, but the rise of cell phones made the booths obsolete. The effort to replace public telephones with Link New York City kiosks, which offer services such as free phone calls, Wi-Fi, and device charging. There are wow. nearly 2,000 kiosks around the city, according to a map from... I went to the map showing where they are. They're fucking everywhere. Wow. That's white. <laughs> oh. Yeah. When you go to East New York, not a fucking lengthy in sight. Uh. Um, but, I mean... Well, I, I just I can't believe they're gone. There's such an iconic part of New York. And I mean, how am I going to reach my mechanic if the wheel on my horse and buggy breaks? How am I going to reach out to him? <laughs> you know, when they to disconnect it, they had to wait online behind 20 drug dealers <laughs> who were using the phone. <laughs> right, right. Old school dudes. Yeah. How is Superman going to jack off in a charging station? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Um, all right, more, more. Wait, you have. An, I'm just going to tell a dumb story. Do you have uh, any other? Phone well, material? I mean, and well, they also said the fire boxes are gone. Remember the fire boxes? You pull the lever, and yeah. they, they're they're like all gone. So I guess deaf people aren't flammable anymore. <laughs> I don't, what, why would they remove the fire boxes? I don't know. I guess they just figure we all have cell phones now, but deaf people don't have cell phones. Just a short, not too funny story about like how wh what happens with our generation is we look back. Uh, how did we do? How did we do shit without cell phones? It's, I know uh, it's like we would meet, we'd go out, I and mean, we we partied hard in New York in the nineties, and it would be like. We had a coordinator. And it's like, well, hey, I can't join you guys. I got a gig at the improv, says you. And it's like, all right, yeah, we'll just we'll be at this bar. But then like we move bars and there is zero way to communicate that yeah. with your friends. Right. And so what we did was, and I think I've told this story before, I would change, I would call in from a payphone, I would call in to my uh voicemail at HBO. And I would change my outgoing message. And I would say, We've, we're at the Raccoon Lodge now. We moved to the Raccoon Lodge. Ah, it's like 1020. There you go. And then, and then all of us, you know, they, people would call in and hear that update. And that's how we did it. But also, do you remember when you would call from school? You'd be at a payphone. You had no money. You needed, like, your parents to pick you up. And this happened. This was done at least twice a week in my house. I'd be after basketball practice or something, get on payphone. Yes, a collect call from Michael and the live operator. Call my mom. My mom's like, hello. It's like, yes, you have it. And I'd be like, pick me up at school. <laughs> and I would just yell it. <laughs> For some reason, they didn't have the ability to mute me. And I would yell, pick me up at school, and then hang out. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember once we were going to Brooklyn, like way the fuck out in Brooklyn. And it was like night. I th it was one of the centennial. I remember it was one of the big fireworks celebrations. It was the Fourth of July, and we had come down. You know, Tarrytown's about a half hour from the city on a train, and we were drinking before we got on the train. We were drinking on the train, and then we got on the subway to go to Brooklyn. And my fucking bladder was so full that I was bent over. I literally finally said to these guys, hey, we got to get off the train. I got to take a piss or my fucking... And they were like, fuck you, man. <laughs> and I was like, you assholes. And so I just got off the train in like by like Prospect Park in Brooklyn. Uh -huh. And I didn't know my way around Brooklyn. <laughs> I'd never been to Brooklyn. So I got off the train and I went and I pissed. I got up on the street and I pissed behind a tree. And then I got back on the train and I was so fucking drunk, I couldn't remember the stop they were getting off at. But I got on, and I just guessed. And then I got off, and I couldn't find them, and I was running around, and I was petrified. It was a fucking bad neighborhood, and I'm running around, and then uh, and then I, I, I couldn't find them. And so, like, I just got back on the train, and I went all the way back to Tarrytown by myself. That's oh, terrible. Wouldn't have happened with cell phones.
Yeah, also that I've told the story before where I found Dan Brickner north of Sydney, Australia, because I asked oh, the bartender. Oh, that's right. That's but, like, right. I fly to Australia. Dan's family has no idea where he is. And I they had a postcard two weeks earlier from Manly, Australia. But everyone, like, if you're young and listening to this podcast, which I don't know if young people do, but it's like, that's what we were up against. Like, so I flew, and my I had a big backup plan, which was I was just going to drive up to the Great Barrier Reef, which I did not realize how far it was at the time. But anyway, um, yeah, because also because you had to use paper maps, um, and it, it was crazy. It's it's we were wait. So talk about your conversation with the bartender. Oh, all right. Well, very quickly as I land. 4 30 or 5 a.m whatever it was i rent a car i drive I see i get a paper map i drive up to manly australia which is nor- like a basically a suburb beautiful beach town outside of sydney north of sydney i go there i pull the car up to some parking spot and i i cra- i go to sleep and then i wake up and now it's still early though it's probably 10 or something and i go to this like third street promenade that we have here and it's like a you know an outdoor kind of mall but it's basically an alcohol mall. It's bar, 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 bar. And I'm like, holy shit. So I went to the first one that opened, and there was a woman there, uh, bartender, like prepping, getting ready. And I go, listen, this is a, a bizarre question to ask. I'm looking for him, and I tell her the story, and I go, and it's in my American friend, and this is what I can tell you. He drinks Mount Gay and Tonic. And she's like, Dan? No shit. <laughs> Swear to God. And wait a minute. You you didn't know even what part of the country he was in? No. I His mom. So I called his mom before I went. And it was the day after Thanksgiving. And I go, hey, hi, Mrs. Brickner. And, I, you know, and she knows me. So I go, hey, and I'm like, I'm, I'm actually going to Australia. And I'd love to hook up with Dan down there. And she's like, oh, great. And I'm like, so do you know where he is? She's like, we don't. And I'm like, what? What? And she's like, well, we got, hold on. And she's like, honey, get me the postcard off the fridge. And they got a postcard two weeks earlier. And the postmark said manly, which she's like, I don't know what that means. So I'm like, oh, okay. I go, but like, did he, you know, yesterday was Thanksgiving. Did he tell you, is he still in manly? He's like, oh, we haven't heard from him since the postcard. I'm like, oh, I'm like, happy Thanksgiving, Mrs. (laughs) Brickner. I'm so, so sorry about your, my friend and your son, Dan not remembering to call you on Thanksgiving or so, being yeah. dead. <laughs> yeah. Or being dead. And so then that's it. I flew that's and hilarious. drove a rented car to Manly and took my shot. Did you guys have fun over there? Oh my God. It was amazing. And she's like, Oh, they'll be down the hill. Like they're usually here pretty soon, you know, on Sundays or whatever it was. And, uh, I was like, all right. And I waited and they came down to drink. That's hilarious. Yeah. It was yeah. great. Yeah, they're. Uh, we were like twenty four, whatever. That three. I called Brickner. Twenty two. I just called Brickner three days ago, just to say hi. Hadn't talked to him in a while. Checking in, and uh, we start talking, and his phone cuts off after about I don't know nine minutes. No call back. What the fuck is that? I like that move. I think it's a shit move. Remember someone, some comedian talked about. He's like. The key to hanging up on someone is you have to hang up while you're talking. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I was like, note to self. Another New York story, an unidentified Brooklyn man jumped <clears throat> to his death Thursday in Manhattan. The incident happened around 1.15 p.m. at 100 United Nations Plaza. According to the New York Post, the 43-year-old was, quote, touring the, the apartment when he asked the agent to show him <laughs> Hey, is the uh, what's the balcony like? He asked him to show him the balcony, and then suddenly jumped off to his death. <laughs> I mean, they really shouldn't tell you the rent on a four hundred square foot studio with stained carpets until you're safely back on the ground. <laughs> well, listen, this proves once again it is impossible to go from Brooklyn back to Manhattan. So true. So true. Every. It, it just flows the other way. You yep. are swimming upstream. Yep. Next stop, Queens. Yeah. Um, I, I hope the realtor got a security deposit before he jumped. <laughs> okay. So if you're the agent, okay, 
you're talking about the square footage of the balcony. You're probably in the middle of a sentence which describes where the sun rises. Is it a Western exposure? You know, I mean, whatever it is. And uh, mid-sentence, he jumps off. <laughs> I guess you look over the rail, which is not the thing to do, but how are you not? Yeah. And you're seeing him fall to the earth. Is the next move, I think if it's me, I'm in shock. But I, I think I immediately, just instinctively, I think I would put my hands up and look around, <laughs> yeah. hoping in with all my might that there's a security camera somewhere right. Right, right. that shows that I didn't kill him. Yep. <laughs> Damn. What yeah. a day at work that is. How was work, honey? Uh didn't didn't sell that uh <laughs> that UN place. Didn't go. Exactly. I fell through. Um, yeah. Literally guy fell got, through. Guy got cold feet. <laughs> <laughs> didn't sign the lease. Um a celebrity a celebrity cruises passenger is suing the cruise line after the ship's medical staff allegedly gave her a blood transfusion from a donor with HIV, leaving her with the virus herself. The woman alleges she underwent the emergency procedure while on a seven-day cruise last year. However, <laughs> on day five, she suddenly became ill. Doctors reportedly discerned that she had suffered a rectal hemorrhage, causing her severe bleeding. Oh, the cruel irony. <laughs> Medical officials then uh, then reportedly solicited blood from passengers over the ship's PA system, <laughs> finding four willing donors. Attention, passengers. The pickleball tournament starts in 15 minutes on the Lido deck. All abortions are canceled. And we have a woman with a bloody asshole who needs blood. HIV is fine. <laughs> um, keep, this is actually the luck. <laughs> The luckiest passenger on that cruise. Everyone else now has a debilitating uh, stomach virus that will not go away. <laughs> the procedure then went through with doctors successfully stopping the bleeding. And the woman finished the final two days of the voyage. That was fun. Uh, sometime later, however, the woman said she tested positive for HIV and she's adamant it's because of the transfusion. In her suit, she says celebrity cruises should be held accountable for the error, even though staffers say the procedure saved her life. Congratulations. Good news and bad news. <laughs> celebrity cruise. All the other passages are envious. They're like, oh, look at the lucky lady just shitting blood. I've <laughs> shit out my whole body on this celebrity cruise, as always happens on celebrity cruises. Yeah. Celebrity cruises. It's a shame the week that 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 week the celebrities were Magic Johnson, Greg Louganis, and Charlie Sheen. <laughs> All right, listen, I'm no detective and I'm not great at deductive reasoning, but I'm guessing the HIV guy who donated blood is the same one that tore up her asshole three days earlier. <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't think it was the infusion uh, yeah, through a yeah. syringe. That yeah, I mean. I mean this was a New York Post story. I want to know what happened to her asshole. <laughs> she had I a just, rectal hemorrhage. Listen, if I were a doctor, it's like an episode of House. So you got HIV. Yeah. All right. How do you think you got it? Well, I got an infusion of blood and one of the donors is an HIV guy. Whoa. Okay. Well, what was going on that you need the infusion of blood? Oh, my asshole was bleeding terribly two days earlier. Oh, okay. I see. I see. Okay. And was that shortly after the, the cruise ship stopped in Haiti? Was that uh, the port At one point, at least, it was the number one way to transmit AIDS uh, is what you just described. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah. 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 It case might still closed. be now that now that. It's probably dirty needles, right? I don't know what. That's interesting. I wonder what the number way, one way HIV is transmitted now is. It's probably changed depending on awareness, you know. I th somebody was just telling me they you still get disqualified from donating blood if you are from a certain country. Iowa. I can't remember which country it is, but you still can't donate blood in this country. Um, let's get, yeah, I to mean, it would, ha I'm guessing it's 
Haiti or an African one of the hotspots? No, spots, it wasn't. It, yeah, it wasn't Haiti. I remember uh, thinking, no, it wasn't Haiti. Um. Anyway, somebody send in that info. What disqualifies you from donating blood in this country? Let's do some and, entertainment. Yep, go. All right, you want to start? Did I write that first line or did you? You did. You did. All right, the line in all caps just says, finished Ozark, fuck you Ozark. I think you wrote so wait, that last whoa, whoa, week whoa, and spoilers, we didn't get to it. Spoilers. Wait, you finished it, right? I did finish it. But I so, told our listeners to watch and finish it this week, so I don't feel bad about spoiling anything. Well, you can skip ahead. Uh, yeah. Skip ahead. All right, well, let's not spoil minute. it, but I will say this. Um, it felt like a final season the entire season, which I don't mean as a good thing. It felt like they were trying to blow it out. They were trying to go big. Um, I like a final season that's like a regular season. It's just better. All right, wait, no. Listeners, cover your ears if it's spoiled. I'm going to say something in three seconds. I get it. I get the writing. They chose evil. They really chose evil. And maybe it's a neat little package that everything this family touched. I wonder if you could look. I think Everything they touched was ruined. Anything that came in their orbit was ruined. So they doubled down on that with the ending. All right, there. Yeah. We'll talk more about it next week. Um, right. The George Carlin documentary, have you seen it? Not yet. All oh, right, I so should let's download wait that week. before my plane. All right, let's 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 talk about that next week. It's you really, saw it and you liked it? It's amazing. It's as good as the Shanling documentary. I think it's better than the Shanling documentary because I think, I think, He's a more compelling figure than Shanling was. Shanling, I get a little tired of the neurotic thing. Um, yeah. You know, George George Carlin was, he was a fucking beast. He was a beast. Dude, his thing on gun control, like, any of these issues today, you can go back. Like, someone posted a clip of his on gun control. Yeah, what he it's say? It's amazing. He, yeah, he's great. Um, I am, um, we just right. finished the most recent season of Atlanta. Have you seen that? The season is, oh, that's what I was waiting for. You can binge the whole thing now? Yeah. It's one of my favorite shows. And I read this. Are you, are you going to, I want, you're going to read this, right? Yeah. There was a, <laughs> there was a, this is unbelievable. I, I mean, the show is so fucking out there. There's, there's a sequence where the rapper character, I forget his name, um, uh, Who, paper boy? boy, paper boy, paper yeah. boy. I mean, sorry. So, so paper boy eats some kind of a drug cookie in Amsterdam and he's wandering around. And what I liked about it is sometimes a director, and I believe that, um, uh, Donald Glover was the director on this episode. Sometimes they have no restraint. And when they do it, when they do a guy on drug episode, it turns into Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club and it gets fucking crazy and stupid. This was like a very restrained but interesting kind of dream sequence that the that the guy goes through, and he goes to a bar that's I think it's called like the the cancel bar, and it's and it turns out it's for all people that have been canceled, and Liam Neeson, who was canceled, I don't know if you remember that, he was going back about oh yeah oh yeah I don't know how many years ago five or six years ago he came out and a friend of his had been raped. And he said something about, I want to find the black guy that did this and and kill him or whatever it was. Um, so Paperboy walks up to the bar and Liam Neeson is fucking standing there. And he says, you might have heard about my transgression. You know what I said about what I wanted to do to any black guy, to black guy, any black guy when I was a younger man. A friend of mine had been raped and I acted out of anger. Neeson said in character, I look back, man, it honestly frightens me. I thought people knowing who I was would make it clear who I am, who I've become. With all that being said, I am sorry. I apologize if I hurt people. Paperboy responds, well, between you and me, I still fuck with Taken before laughing. It's good to know that you don't hate black people. Neeson quips in return, what? No, no, no. I can't stand a lot of you. Now I feel that way because you tried to ruin my career. Didn't succeed, mind you. I'm sure one day I'll get over it. But until then, we are mortal enemies. Paperboy says back, but didn't you learn that you shouldn't say shit like that? 
Neeson concludes with cameo with, I, but I also learned that the best and worst part about being white is that you don't have to learn anything if you don't want to. <laughs> Fucking crazy. I mean, this is a guy that gets paid $20 million a movie. He is a very bankable commodity that is hand he has handlers that that try to control every word out of his mouth and then somehow he goes on a show and does this that is fucking ballsy i love it and he might have timed it right you know <clears throat> we're saying you know that we think the pendulum has peaked on the woke stuff and is, is starting to come back down even among in our woke community and our woke uh, profession so the timing might be right where this is a fucking joke and maybe people will see it for what it is which was not happening the last three years yeah right um and he's sending himself up while also kind of not shying away from going to the bad thing he did i think it's perfect right right it seems like a gervais remember the show extras yeah you know like it seems it seems very like that where they they have to get a brave celebrity who's going to play a version of themselves, which is terrible. Yes. Ben Stiller on Extras was amazing. I just watched uh, Kate Winslet. Oh, and, yeah. And, you know, So she's dressed as a nun in a Nazi movie, and she's talking about how to win an Oscar, which is you have to play a handicapped person. I think that's the word she used. And, um, and she lists who's won for playing a challenged person in an Oscar. But... She's talking about how to win an Oscar while being in this Nazi movie that was in extras. Three years later, she won an Oscar for being in a Nazi movie. That's right. Yeah. Fuck. <clears throat> um, you want to talk about the Nicolas Cage movie? So, listen, it's not great, but I'm being literal. It's, I loved it. I just want to... Uh, you know, you know, I don't want to blow expectations uh, too Because aren't too high. people freaking out about how great it is? They might be a bit. Like I, but because I heard that, I was expecting something like really, really great. Um, but it just reminded me how much I like him. And uh, before this podcast, we didn't have a good connection. And so you had to like shut down and I had to wait three minutes. And I saw I was going to talk about this movie. There is a there is a YouTube clip and it's called well I mean the title on the clip is called Nicolas Cage losing his shit and it's a montage of Nicolas Cage losing his shit but the real name of the clip though is Nicolas Cage freak out which is hyphenated montage it is so fucking funny but in this movie you know it's in the trailer he does a thing like because there's a young Nick Cage. I'm not giving anything away, really. There's a young Nick Cage that yells at old Nick Cage sometimes. But anyway, though, you think he goes, he goes, uh, he's like, you're Nicholas. <laughs> and he, he screams <laughs> it forever. And instead of going, Nicholas, and instead of going like, Cage, he goes, Nicholas. And when he gets to the end of his breath on Nicholas, he's like, whoa, 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 <laughs> Cage. <laughs> and it fucking destroyed me. <laughs> And it was even like the lad. They, they, it's so good. Like during credits, just as an end note, like you heard that audio play again, and I was all about it. It was so. Now wait, the, the funny. Hollywood royalty of Nicolas Cage is, uh, is it um, Coppola? Who, yeah, Francis Ford Coppola, and then obviously Sofia Coppola. But then there's others. There's Talia others. Talia Shire. The oh right. I believe. Yeah. I didn't look any of this up, but he's a Coppola. Yeah. Wow. Uh, partly at least. And um we're all partly something. And so uh yeah, that that's the royalty, but like, you know, maybe it started with Valley Girl. I I probably don't have that right. But they, you know, whatever. I'm not gonna talk about the movie anymore. But you know, I'm just sitting there and Is I it worth remember... seeing in a theater? Uh you know, there's very big shots, you know, like oh, and it takes place in a gorgeous town. In Mallorca, at least that's what they said, and I think it is Mallorca. Um, so it's beautiful and everything, and it is, there is action and all that stuff. Um, maybe. What else are you going to see in a theater right now? Well, Tom Cruise. Oh, okay. Top Gun. Right. 
You know, they're saying about him, he's the last movie star, like bankable, you know? What about Liam Neeson? I don't know. Black people aren't going to, no. I have no idea. Um, no, Liam Neeson's not the Memorial Day blockbuster. Sure he is. Oh, okay. Bruce Maybe. Willis was. Not oh, anymore. Boy. No, no, no. But Tom Cruise is like, I mean, it's like gold dust, you know? Like, it's it's... It's it's a lock usually. Anyway. Yeah. I don't know what is Chris, what does Chris think? Chris, would you who are some other bankable movie stars? The Rock? Oh god. Sadly <laughs> that's true. I don't know if The Rock is. A lot of his can come and go. The Rock to me, Rock is the acting equivalent of Kiss. Interesting. I kind of like that. But uh, we like Kiss, but we like Kiss. No, we don't. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Sorry. I hate Kiss. Catchy tunes. At least four of them. Name four. Oh, Detroit Rock City. I mean, Beth is not what I'm referring to. And uh, trust me, they come on the radio and I sing along with them. You know I can't name shit. Um, but, but yeah. All right, what's this? Uh, FX. I wanna, wait, what's, the, what's the, big, the biggest one? The sing along. Uh, I want to rock and roll all night and party every day. Come on, man. I ah, know that one. Want to rock and? I can't sing yeah, it. We're going to be fucking one. canceled it's, on YouTube because my pitch is so perfect. The device that they use will catch me. Oh, right. We'll get flagged for the episode. Right. Um, what's this FX pistol based on Steve Jones' book, Tuesday on Hulu? What? Oh, my God. It reminds me how much I fucking love some of punk music. You know, Clash, my favorite band. But it's the, it's, um, the, you had Steve Jones on your podcast. I did. You, fo you forwarded me illegally his memoir. And this is based on that memoir. And most of all, it's train spotting guy. God damn my memory. Directing. Boyle. Danny Boyle. Oh, no and, shit. No, no, this is legit. But just even hearing that, da -na 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 -na, here I go with my perfect pitch again, but the opening, you know, the opening guitar, that album, I remember when I was at HBO, keep in mind that was in the roaring 90s. Never mind I the remember bollocks. Chris, remember my boss from uh, New Zealand, Chris Spencer? Chris Spencer, of course. He knew more about music than like anyone I knew. Like Weinstein also was up there, but Chris really. And Chris was like, there is something about that album like no other I have. When I put it on, it still is so vibrant and now yeah, and edgy and edgy still, not layers of intellectual edgy, but literally edgy. And that was in the 90s, and I'm saying it now. Yeah, absolutely. Stands Nevermind up. the Bullocks is fucking bonkers. Now, I listen to Nirvana now, and I feel like, that was explosive at a time, but I don't feel it today the same way. Right. Um, but Steve Jones, what a fucking story, man. I remember I had him on the podcast. We did a long one. There was His book is incredible. What a fuck. Everybody tries to play like they're a badass, especially if you're in a rock band. You want to have a good backstory. Nobody tops Steve Jones's backstory. He was like, uh, his father was a professional boxer who left home when he was a kid, and he was he was arrest. I forget how many times he was arrested, but it was like a crazy amount, like forty yeah. times or something. And then he, um, I think he was in jail for a while, and taught himself how to play guitar. Was illiterate until he was like forty. <laughs> he's he's a DJ here in LA. Yes, on a he's radio got station. Jonesy's he is jukebox. So, so fucking funny. Yeah. And Jonesy's you can, jukebox. You can get it online too, yeah, obviously. It's like old FM radio. It's a guy that knows a lot about music and he brings in great guests and he plays amazing music and he's incredibly open minded. Like I'm surprised with some of the stuff he plays. He, he Unbelievable. He, yeah. Loves huge glam. range of stuff. You know, you'd think this punk guy would reject all that, like, and God, real affinity for Bowie, you yeah. know, um, kind of an expert on it. And right. No, he's great. All of a sudden the Smiths, you know, but anyway, 
he's he is so great and um there's a famous look up the clip because i'm gonna absolutely slaughter this story but they were on this 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 like almost like this mike douglas type almost like a johnny carson of britain and they were on a show there and Susie from Susie and the Banshees, I think maybe was with them, but some good looking woman or attractive woman, you know, in the punk scene was on the couch with them. And uh, he like a host said something and it was like a little smarmy. And Steve Jones, who I think was fucked up, was like, you dirty fucker and said, fucker. This is British TV in the 70s. Like, you dirty, dirty. And the guy goes, what? And like, try to like, he's like, and he just goes, you dirty, dirty fucker. And, and maybe call them a pervert, but go find the clip. It's for yeah, sure on YouTube. Yeah, and I think YouTube. the guy kind of challenged him to curse. Like he, I think he said something like, uh, "Oh, what are you gonna curse on here? Are you gonna?" And he yeah. fucking did it. He's like, "Oh, if you're gonna challenge me, I'm gonna do it." But also, like the direct sticking up to a guy who's like thinly veiled creepiness, you know. But he's, you know, he's such a household show and name with his tie and coat. Yeah. And yeah. Jones just cut right through it. Yeah. I love it. That's uh, great. Do we want to do this next story or should we skip it? Which story? Yeah, Kevin Spacey, pervert convicted. Corden did tell me, James Corden told me about, and it was in England. He's like, he became, I think, the Vic Theater maybe? The yeah, creative the, director. Right. And it was non this is all allegedly non-stop auditions. And Corden was, you know, a theater guy and goes, everyone in town was like, would have to get a drink and be like, have you had your audition for Spacey yet? And it was like tr they were like survivors. Wow. So He's he like, has been he goes, I'm not gonna work there. I said no. You know, like so he's yeah. been charged with four counts of sexual assault against three men. Four counts against three men. Oh, so one of them, one of them he uh, violated twice. Spacey was also charged with one count of causing a person to engage in penetrative sexual activity without consent. The woman on the cruise ship. <laughs> <laughs> Spacey was also the director of the uh, celebrity cruise ship? Yeah, he did the announcements. Yeah, everything. Um so anyway, man, I don't know. May, nobody even knew he was gay until this came out. Maybe he just drives on the other side of the road when he's in England. <laughs> oh, and That's did I say Corden? I did not mean James Corden for the record. Uh, so I just want to say that officially. Who did you mean? I don't know. Um, this is a bit of ass covering right now. <laughs> but I have officially said I was kidding. It was not him. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's do some Florida, man. You got it, punk. Florida. Okay. This This is perfect. I didn't even have to write anything for this. I rearranged the story a little, so it's so it's a story. Florida man totals tractor trailer during delivery to public shopping center. This is a true story. Michael Calvo, 51, of Cape Coral, was making a delivery in the back of the shopping center when his truck tore an awning off the building and hit an unoccupied pickup truck, pushing it about 200 feet. Both vehicles were totaled. When an officer approached Calvo following the crash, Calvo stated that he thought he was being pranked by a television show and did not immediately come out of the 53-foot tractor. Police say Calvo's erratic behavior caused a commotion in the shopping center with many employees and customers showing up to see what was happening. After a few minutes, the officer was able to remove Calvo from the truck and asked if he had fallen asleep been drinking or is experiencing a medical emergency the officer said calvo responded by saying quote i was smoking my meth pipe <laughs> <laughs> he, and he was not lying he was arrested in charge of possession of meth disorderly conduct resisting arrest without violence and possession of narcotic narcotics paraphernalia wow they got him for the pipe too so this is why we like Florida Man yeah. stories. They come with punchlines. They don't seem to be aware that uh, there's laws anymore because they're in Florida. <laughs> or I love this guy's honesty. Yeah. 
<laughs> not even I'm on I'm on meth. I was yeah. smoking, which is what, yeah. what what's worse than being meth when you're driving a truck is actively smoking meth yeah. while you're driving yeah. a truck. It reminds me of when um, my parents lived uh, by Lincoln Center for a little while, and uh, they my dad stepped on my mom's foot and broke her toe, and so they went to the emergency room, and the emergency room in that neighborhood is really rough, and yeah. so. So there, I can't remember which emergency room it was. They might have gone up to uh, what's the one up in um, by Columbia. Anyway, uh, Columbia Press. Yeah, Columbia Press. So they're waiting to go in, and uh, they're online behind a guy, and they said he had a he had on a raccoon skin jacket and hat, <laughs> and uh, and he had a lot of bling, and he go and the, and the lady goes, uh, okay, what are your symptoms? She's so checking him, in, and he goes, he goes. Uh, well, I got, I got a fever and I'm, uh, I'm sweating and, uh, I'm shaking and she goes, any other symptoms? And he goes, yeah, I got a bullet in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, I'm a little uncomfortable with your Jewish accent and, uh, stereotyping. <laughs> Last and far from least, I have a bullet in my hand. Uh, let's go international. If we must. Didn't the French tits cover that up top? We got that. At least 19 people were shot and several others were wounded at a cockfighting pit in Mexico on Sunday. Gunfire hmm. was reported at Palenque, or cockfighting arena, in the town of Las Tinajas in the state of Michoacan. Cockfighting is illegal in Mexico. Uh, it, cockfighting is legal in Mexico. Michoacan in central Mexico is one of the most violent states in the country, but <laughs> also one of the largest exporters of avocados in the world. Oh, it's sweet, too. That's nice. Excuse me, waiter, why is there uh, blood and feathers in my guacamole? <laughs> Come for the cockfighting, stay for the guac. Uh, wow. Jesus. I don't know. You know, that's the thing. Like, you know, obviously humans relate more to dogs. It's more, this story will get no traction. But if dog fighting was still really big, you yeah. know, the same, even dog fighting over bullfighting, you know? If you were on vacation in Mexico, and somebody said, hey, there's a cockfight down the street at this place. Do you want to go? Would you go? No. Yeah, I don't think Is I there a way either. to bet on it, like on my phone? Uh, no, I Yeah. I would say, here's the thing. I Here's a good example. I was in a Mexican town, I forget where, and they had a bull ring. And it was a th thing to go there. And it was not top shelf. This is not A-list bullfighting. But- Bullfights, like let's say it was Friday nights or something like that. And tourists would go as well. And I, the only reason I didn't go, something came up or whatever. I, I would have gone because I just had this romanticism, you know, big Hemingway fan. And, you know, it's in literature. And, you know, you've seen, you know, stuff written about the real artists, the real greatest matadors, you know, and, and, and the artistry to it and all that. And then at some point in my life, I found out, how bullshit the whole thing is and how rigged it is and how sure, you know, this matador might be a good fucking dancer, but who gives a shit? It's like a drugged bull and it's no chance. And, um, and so I would never go. Now. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't go to any of that. I think it's, uh, I think it's pretty sick, but you're um, seeing, a, you're basically seeing a fucking good dancer in the most ridiculous outfit in all, in anything ever, I think. Do you remember uh, in The Jerk, there was a scene where there was cat fighting? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that was in part of his, I think he might have done a short film like in his stand-up. Oh, he did. Yeah, he did. And I love hearing those stories because, you know, we have friends who like when they start to oh, make no, no, it no, or whatever, no, wait. Oh, sorry, go ahead. They'll pluck, you know, something they did while they were a stand-up, you know? Yeah. No, it was cat juggling. It wasn't cat right, fighting. Right, that's what it was. Cat juggling. Yeah. You're right. The cruel, cruel <laughs> practice of catch up. Uh, all right. Let's get to some sports. Mm. 
All right. I got nothing on this story, but it's nice. Colin Kaepernick Maybe. trained with the Las Vegas Raiders this week, signaling a potential comeback to the NFL. <laughs> the 34-year-old who drew controversy for kneeling during the national anthem, uh, protesting racial injustice, has not been involved in an NFL game in more than five years. In hmm. 2017, he opted out of his 49ers contract, became a free agent. No NFL team signed him. In October 2017, he won his grievance case against the NFL, alleging that teams were colluding to deny him a job. Raiders owner Mark Davis said he would welcome Kaepernick with open arms, provided the team's coaches and general managers were on board. I, I mean, I think this is great. Okay. All right, guys. Good workout. Let's do some deep lunges. Except you, Kaepernick. You just keep doing some jumping jacks. <laughs> All right, guys, great workout. Form a circle, take a knee. Kaepernick, here's a stool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, oh God, I hope he makes it. I can't believe he won that case. I can't believe these fuckers weren't able to cover their trail, you know? I know. I think it's there's hard another to prove guy. That. It's very hard to prove that. Yes, I know. But I think they intercepted an email that was like a smoking gun. That they put it, that's what I mean. Like, why wouldn't these fucking gentlemen white agreements be on the phone? Yeah, crazy. Um, so it's so great that there was a paper trail. Nobody should be fired for taking a knee. Well, Boy Scout masters and priests. Those are the only ones that should be fired for taking, those are two knees. And they never are. Just Kaepernick. Uh, let's get to science and technology. Okay, monkeypox, top advisor to the World Health Organization, said the leading theory to explain the spread of the disease was sexual transmission among gay. We are doing a lot of gay sex today. Yep. Among gay and bi, oh, sorry, bisex, bisex, uh, and bisexual men at two raves held in Spain and Belgium. The singling out has sparked fears that gay and bisexual men who appear to account for the majority of Europe's monkeypox cases so far are once again in danger of being stigmatized as carriers of an exotic and frightening disease, just as they were during the AIDS crisis. Mm. Yeah. So I think I know the latest person who's come down with monkeypox. Who's that? That woman on the cruise who got her ass torn up. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Let's not forget about her. I'm going to reference her till we hang up yeah. this podcast today. So this was at a rave. I'm trying. It must have been a hell of a rave. I'm picturing a chimpanzee with a glow stick sucking on a pacifier. <laughs> More than a glow stick. Bad news for gay men. Good news for Bob Geldorf. <laughs> He's gonna have another live aid. Have another live aid, live monkey, monkey aid. I mean, Bob Gildorf. Don't get me wrong. What was, what was he? The Boomtown Rats. Was that his band? Uh, yeah, I don't like Mondays. About yeah. a school shooting. Right. But I mean, he had an interesting career. But his career really was that one event, producing that one event. Is that crazy? This is what I love. I love. Didn't we get called by a podcast to go ruin a movie? Like you know, you 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 criticize a feel good movie. Oh yeah, right. So mine would be, you know, I have a lot, obviously, because as the listeners have said, I'm dead inside with Coda being deaf while hunting and everything. But I would the Queen movie. I so enjoy tearing apart. Which and the Queen Geldof movie? thing in that was. He said, fuck you to Queen, because Queen went down and played Sun City in violation of everybody's agreement to boycott because of apartheid. Right. Queen went, took the money, and they were not broken up at all. And then they called Live Aid, like, what the fuck are you thinking? Like, we're Queen, we're going to play. And he's like, you know, I think philosophically and politically we're on different pages, and this wouldn't be the festival for you. This would be helping Africa. And by Africa, we mean the people that need help in Africa. And Queen threw a fucking hissy fit. And Geldof, they, under pressure, acquiesced. It was really late, so he gave them their time slot. Queen again pitched a fucking hissy fit because the sun was still out when they took their time on. And Geldof goes, then go fuck yourselves. And Queen took the gig. 
I think I've. I'm confused. Live Aid was actually for aid in Africa. I was thinking it was Live Aids. <laughs> it didn't. It did. Something else raised money for AIDS. I oh, think, you're right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Live Aid was Africa. Well, I'm glad I got which, to tell my Live Aid story, even though. Uh, which even was though the? It didn't give a shit about gay people with AIDS. No, although I'm sure a lot of the Africans had AIDS. But what what was the one that raised money for AIDS? Yeah, I mean, well. Ellen John has the, the the most famous ongoing one that every year is Oscar party. Um, yeah, wasn't was there a huge one? This would be or, a time where no. it would be so great if we had a producer who like looked stuff up while we were talking. Well, Ronald Reagan famously didn't say the word for the longest time. Oh, that's right. Yeah, with a gay son, by the way. Yeah. Um. So. It really, I mean, again, for young listeners, this the word stigma was in this article. You have no idea how stigmatized AIDS was. Yeah. It was like these filthy people, what do, you, what do they expect? It, right. it, was, it honestly was not far from that. Right. Well, you saw it a little bit with COVID. There was people were willing to give obese and elderly people a death sentence. Because they're not, you know, because they ate too much or they're too old. They're, they're willing to accept death. All right, here right. we go. The Freddie Mercury Tribute Concert for AIDS Awareness, Wembley Stadium, 1992. No, I don't remember that. Queen wasn't invited to that either. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, let's do uh, this, day, this day in history. Okay. This was something, I was shocked when this came up. I did not know this. I don't know if you knew this story. I did at one point now that I'm scanning it, but May I 20, forgot. May 29th, 1979, Woody Harrelson's father is arrested for murder. Judge John Wood, known as Maximum John, is assassinated outside his San Antonio, Texas home as he bent down to look at a flat tire on his car. Actor Woody Harrelson's father, Charles Harrelson, was charged with the murder after evidence revealed that drug kingpin Jimmy Chagra, whose case was about to come up before Maximum John, had paid him $250,000. Chagra, worried about the sentence that was soon to be imposed by Judge Wood, apparently conspired with his wife and brother to hire Harrelson to carry out the murder. Shattered bullet fra fragments found at the scene were traced to a 240, a 240 Weatherby Mark V rifle, the type recently purchased by Harrelson's wife, Joanne. Har Harrelson, who had a prior conviction for murder in 1968, was convicted and sentenced to two life sentences. So he got out. He had already murdered somebody. And he got wow. two more life sentences. Joanne, convicted of conspiracy to obstruct justice and perjury, was later paroled. Woody Harrelson funded his father's appeals, enlisting the aid of controversial attorney Alan Dershowitz. Charles Harrison died on March 15th, 2007, at age 69, of a heart attack in his cell at Colorado's Supermax Federal Prison. Well, in a weird way, it's another Texas uh, gun killing. Right. Right. Um, but damn, I did not. I, I didn't know anything about Woody Harrelson's childhood, but I guess his father was probably put away when he was a kid. Oh yeah, for sure. Wow, I mean, you dug you. That's a that's a uh, deep cut on the this day one. in history. I'll yeah. say that. Yeah, I went deep. So, all right, uh, Woody. All right, let's do some letters from the editor. His dad in prison watching his son on Cheers. Right. Hey, Norm, and then him <laughs> going, "Hey, Woody." Uh, Jen McGowan said, you can give plasma for money. It's twice a week, and it's about $100 a week if you go twice. If It's very safe. They test for the donors for everything. <laughs> you have a medical exam, and, the ch and they check your blood and vitals every time you donate. Not on celebrity cruises. No, they don't. With they the don't. woman who got her ass tore up. <laughs> <laughs> How was the cruise? Um... I didn't like the chairs. Chairs were a little uncomfortable. Um, to the toilet paper was very rough. Yep. JB says, hey, gentlemen, went to the beach 
The Beach Life Show and J Rad was indeed rad. Jazzy punk, rock dead. Good recommendation. Thanks. Looked for you there, but there were too many white dad dudes there to see if you were in attendance. Mm -hmm. Got the VIPs, took a friend, lost her right before Steve Miller, and while dancing, had one of those penthouse forum letters experiences. Oy, and I thought I was too old for this. While dancing? That's disgusting. Jesus. So, yeah, weren't we supposed to go to that J-Rad thing? What happened? Yeah, I couldn't go. It was, uh, it was a Sunday. Um, I forget why I couldn't go, but yeah. Yeah. There is a um, couple good shows coming up at the Hollywood Bowl. I think Smashing Pumpkins with Jane's Addiction opening for them should wow. be good. That's this summer. Smashing Pumpkins, is inc they're incredible. Yeah. And that's all, folks. Obituary. Uh, uh. This is a sad one. Ray Liotta, the uh, actor who uh, broke out in the 1990 Martin Scorsese film Goodfellas after starring in Field of Dreams. I had forgotten about that. I thought he, it was the other way around. That's interesting. Okay. He was 67. Um, he died in his sleep in the Dominican Republic where he was shooting the film Dangerous Waters. Leaves behind a daughter, Carson. Not Karen, Carson. He was yeah. engaged to be married to J.C. Natola. He'd had a big res uh, resurgence. Recent turns included The Many Saints of Newark. He was fucking great in that, The yep. Many Saints of Newark. Marriage I didn't say story. It. I shouldn't say yep. I heard that. Marriage story for which he shared the two, 2020 in Indie Spirit Award for its ensemble and No Sudden Move. He finished the Elizabeth Banks directed Cocaine Bear, which was due to star in the and, and was due to star in the working title film The Substance Opposite Demi Moore and Margaret Qualley. Uh, won its primetime Emmy from ER in 2005. Uh, anyway, he won a lot of stuff, but I mean, obviously, he's always going to be remembered for uh, Goodfellas. I mean, you just talk about a great film mm. that was brought to an entirely different level by the perfect casting of, of the lead. And he's the first guy that called out, Karen! Karen! Yeah, that's right. He started Karen. Uh, there's one scene when she flushes the drugs down the toilet. He won't stop saying Karen, and I'm wondering if it was scripted that way. Yeah. He's like, Karen, what did you do? And then it would be like this. He's like, Karen, what the fuck? Like, every, he, Karen was in, like, almost every line. It was hysterical. Yeah. Now the way that the way that movie built, I mean, when you get to the sequence where the helicopter is following him around while oh, he's running it. errands, he, he he just is he must have actually done coke. There's no way he pulled off that manic energy without actually doing cocaine. When the, the doctor in the hospital is like, "Hey, we should check you out too." He's just there to pick up his brother. He it I, I, yes, totally believable. Yeah, you're looking at him like no doctor would look at you normally. That's how bad you look. Yeah. yeah. Sweating, the sunken eyes, the rings around the eyes. Like, uh, And, yeah, and boy, did he play that. Uh, what a tense scene. Oh, my God. That's one of the best scenes in film history. Yeah. Uh, with with the Rolling, name the Rolling Stones song that was playing while he was. Uh... Dun-dun, 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 dun-dun. Isn't it that? Oh, I can't do it. I'm pitch perfect again. Um isn't it? Uh, it's not Monkey Man. It's uh, yeah. I think it's Monkey. Can you man. hear me knocking? Maybe. Uh, I don't know. No, I think it's. I think it might be Monkey Man. I think you're right. Let's see if Chris looks it up. Um. But you know the amazing thing about the way he played that role is it started with him as a boy, as this sort of like fly on the wall, in this gangster world. And he never lost that innocence. He never lost yeah. that voyeurism about the world he was living in. Even when he was the tough guy, even when he was, you know, beating Karen's boy, uh, ex-boyfriend with a gun or whatever, like he fucking, he carried so many layers during that role. It was amazing. No, incredible. Um, uh, I'm going to watch Goodfellas again. I think that's on everybody's mind. You know, who was, who was a fan? Oh, it was Monkey Man. All right. I think I, think I watch it. I, I, I watch it one, once a year for the last however many years it's been it's out. It's one of those great movies that when it's on, um, and there's a special quality to some of these movies, you could, even if it's halfway through, you just start watching. And oh, sometimes yeah. you, 
sometimes you don't even know it's halfway through because it jumps around a little bit. Like yeah. it'll be like, now this guy, and it'll jump back and give the story. I Annie Hall, this, um, there's there's a bunch of them. Raising uh, Arizona. Tarantino, um, Pulp Fiction. Yeah. You know, like you just can come Where in and you're like. the scenes just stand on their own. Yeah. yeah. Um, so good. We also want to, uh, in the obituary section, we're going to read the names of the victims in Rob Elementary. This is so fucked up. I mean, I'm not adding anything to the conversation by saying I heard about a school shooting, right? And I pictured again, like the one that happened, was it in Michigan, I believe, you know, where their star guy, like, got killed, the football player, because he did run at the shooter, you know? Right. And, like, so that's what I had in mind, and it's soul-crushing and all that. And But what you're picturing is, like, maybe peers to the shooter who he hates and people that are running and avoiding it and and uh uh, god where am i even going with this but like just like teens who maybe even charge the shooter you know or or like have a chance at stopping them and then people like no 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 these kids were 10 and i was like i had to sit down yeah yeah i don't even know how physically you you know he's mentally ill but pull a trigger it's like Shooting a fucking puppy. Like, I, I just. Like, it's, looking them it, in the eyes. They're looking at you, scared. It's fucking. I can't even go ah. on about it. Yeah. Uh, Navia Bravo, Jacqueline Cazares, McKenna Lee Elrod, Jose Flores Jr., Ilana Ellie Garcia, Irma Garcia, Uzia Garcia, Amiria Garza, Xavier Lopez. Jace Carmelo Luvenus, Tess Marie Mata, Miranda Mathis, Eva Morales, Alethea Marie, Marie Ramirez, Annabelle Guadalupe Rodriguez, Mayte Rodriguez, Alexandria Lexi Rubio, Layla Salazar, Jayla Silguaro, Ileana Cruz Torres, and Rogelio Torres. What? All 10 and 11 years old. Except Eva Morales, 44. She was a fourth grade teacher who had been teaching for 17 years. And Irma Garcia, 46, fourth grade teacher, uh, taught at Robb Elementary School for 23 years and was a mother of four. And then I don't know one of them. One of those teachers, the husband came to her, came to see her at the school and then went home and sat down with the family and had a heart attack and died at the table. Did you hear about that? Yeah, it was maybe like two days, whenever, yeah, whenever it was, <sighs> he did die of a heart attack. Mm. And people were like, oh, you know, I, I, I've had to go to Facebook for this dumb project. I'm doing whatever, looking at animal clips, but I never go there. But of course, people are like, he died of a broken heart. He died of a, well, maybe, maybe he died of fucking rage. Yeah. Which you could say is the same thing, but it's not as kind of quaint and nice a story. Yeah. It's fucking tragic. So, anyway. I think we just go out on that. I don't know if we should do the funnies. Um, No. I can't. Yeah. I, I, I think we should. Also, here's a good subject changer. I'm like running as late for this flight as you usually do for every flight. That's what's happening right now. All right. Well, another reason to go out. Um, Why don't you sit there and stew in what you just did to everybody uh, and enjoy the the nice effect of mushrooms just leaving your body. (laughs) Why don't you do that, Gregory, and think about what you've done. Oh, what have I done? On a comedy podcast. No, I'm I'm glad you did it. No. You should do that. Uh, it's very easy to dehumanize this, and it's statistics, and it's yet another school. No, these are kids, people. Yeah, I mean, what an age. Ten years old, fourth grade. Ah, oh, the innocence lost. All right, you don't have to go back so, there again. All right. I, I all much right. prefer anger over sadness. I, well, how long have you known me? All right. Thank you, uh, Midcoast Media, for doing a great job, and uh, Mike. We'll see you next week. We maybe. Um, yeah, we have to talk about next week. Okay. Uh, 
because I'll be out of town. What are you doing next week? I'm around. Bakersfield isn't until the 11th, right? Yeah. Okay, so we'll talk about next week. Maybe it's one we skip, or we can do it midweek, maybe. Okay. All right. All Love right, you, then. Greg. Love you. I'm Bye. glad you have. I do though, and I'm glad you have this uh, this potential for the shrooms to work. That would be if that's your answer, man. That's the greatest thing ever. Uh, wouldn't that be nice? I know. Well, hopefully, it's something that I mean. The pharmaceutical industry is really scared. They are trying to shut this down because there's so many people that might be able to go off of antidepressants by using mushrooms, which we understand better, which is organic and uh, has a history. So we'll see. Um, okay. We'll see you next week. Way to end it on yourself when there was that tragedy in Texas. I know, so right? Good job. Yeah. Take it ish. Take it ish. Sunday papers. Sunday papers. Sunday papers. With Greg and Mike.